transition into sermon time this morning, we realize that <clears throat> we're getting back to regular schedule, regular people after the conclusion of our gospel meeting on Wednesday evening. And we trust that those lessons on growth in Christ will continue to benefit this church in days to come on our spiritual growth. Heaven's grace. <laughs> that's obviously grace that's in heaven or grace that has originated there and can be found in other places. But I would suggest to you at the very beginning, this is a grace that every one of us absolutely must have. If we don't have heaven's grace in our life, we're in trouble. In a lot of different ways, on a lot of different levels. So let's think about the grace of God as it is found, or the heaven's grace as it is found in scripture. This expression is probably pretty familiar. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that that should be familiar is because in some form, almost this form in most cases, it's found in every one of Paul's epistles. In 14 epistles, except in the book of Hebrews, it's not found until the very last statement in the book. The Apostle Paul wishes, prays, that grace and peace be given to Christians. And when you think about that, that's pretty comprehensive, pretty evasive into Christianity, how big this is. But we would notice from this statement that both are from the Father and from the Son and therefore from heaven. Grace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So heaven's grace to you have we stopped to think about the significance of that? How important that is. And how much of a role that should have in our life. Let's talk about meaning for just a second before we get into some other things here. The word grace comes from the word, it's pronounced charis, as if the first letter were a K, is but in one word, which really doesn't do justice to the full definition, but in one word, favor. And something to note about this is that charis excludes merit all the time. No merit in charis. In other words, no one can say, I got heaven's grace because I deserved it or because I earned it. There is no merit, no earning in Caris. And therefore, a good way to remember the meaning is unmerited favor. A little personal note on that. I can remember that this is the one of the first Bible words that I learned as a kid in Bible class. We were taught Bible words with Bible meanings. We go into class and a teacher would ask, who can tell us today the meaning of the word grace? My hand would go up and so would probably every other hand in class because we were taught the meaning of Bible words. Unmerited favor. Well, as I grew, I learned it had more in its meaning than that. As you study scriptures in regard to the meaning, your understanding of the word expands with scripture. But I was preaching a gospel meeting one time in Columbus, and a man came up to me after services, and he said, I've got a, a problem. And the only problem he had was with my definition of the word grace. He said, you can't define grace as unmerited favor. So he began to explain to me why that was so. 
I returned to him and explained why that is an accurate definition. <laughs> because it means favor and there is no merit, so why would it not be unmerited? There are other ways it could be said. Undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor. <laughs> and that just sticks because that is truly what the word means in almost every occurrence can be defined in that sense. I hope even our young people in this congregation have learned the meaning of grace in its different applications. We would suggest from this definition, it's a New Testament theme of gigantic importance. Is that an exaggeration? Absolutely not. When you look at, at a concordance and you let your, even let your computer do the searching, you come up with 150 plus occurrences in the New Testament, which indicates to every Bible student that it's pretty important. It's pretty significant. It's everywhere, but mostly in Paul's epistles. But another thing about the word grace, it pulls us in, draws us in with its powerful and its compelling appeal. There's just something about the word grace. Maybe it's because of what we know about it. It just comes along with our understanding and all of that is thought of and felt when we hear the word itself. But even parents have named some of their daughters grace because of the sounding of the term. But we also have to note like many Bible themes, it is at the center of controversy. What? Can't we have anything in the Bible without controversy? It's awfully hard, isn't it? It seems like most things in the Word of God are somehow involved in dispute and controversy of some sort, but lo and behold, so is the word grace. We'll address that briefly later on in the lesson. I would feel it inadequate or insufficient in this sermon if we did not at least look at where the controversy is and the Bible answer to the controversy, and we will note that. But I'm suggesting that grace impacts our life. Whether we know it or not, it does. So that causes us to think Use our minds and our hearts to think, okay, how does it impact my life? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, and I've reduced it down to two words. And if you can remember these two words, you can remember how grace impacts your life, what it does to you and for you in your existence here on this planet Earth. <clears throat> at Ephesus in chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. So that's a very clear affirmative statement that heaven's grace saves us. Well, let's take a look at that. What that means then, if you're saved, if you're truly, honestly in a saved condition, some people think they are when they're really not. But if you really are, then you have been saved by grace. Now, that is not to suggest, and don't misunderstand me, the only thing by which we are saved. There are many things in the New Testament that saves us. But one of them is grace. And grace becomes God's part as we recognize what it is that <clears throat> makes our part possible. If it were not for heaven's grace, there's nothing in this world that you could do, ever. It's heaven's grace that makes it possible for you to even have a part. <laughs> and furthermore, to make it work so that truly it results in your salvation. Grace makes salvation 
a gift. Isn't that what Paul affirmed to the Ephesians? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works or anything that you have done to earn that no one should boast. Now this is not to suggest that the faith only doctrine is scriptural. It's not to suggest that we do not have a part. When he talks about this, having acts of obedience, our faith being obedient to the commands of Christ does not exclude salvation from grace. So we could give illustrations of that, but that's true as we see it in effect really uh, every day. But earlier in Ephesians, the second chapter, and in verse 5, the Apostle Paul wrote, I'll say further, but actually before, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ by grace have you been saved. Let me explain the reason that the word God or God's name is in parentheses is because it doesn't actually occur in this verse. I have added that in typing this on this chart. It's found in verse 4, and verse 5 is simply a grammatical continuation of verse 4 where Paul has identified God. So who is it that made us alive together with Christ? Paul has identified him as God has done that. But you notice the last affirmative statement, by grace have you been saved. And so, without salvation, what the Apostle Paul is making known in this passage, we're spiritually dead. Death is simply separation. We know what that means physically, but spiritually, it is the separation of our spirit from God. When that separation exists, there is an alienation. That alienation is identified in Scripture as spiritual death. Even when you were dead in your sins, in your transgressions, in our salvation, let us never forget that God makes us alive with Christ and in Christ. That's a description of what salvation means. Yes, it is the forgiveness of sins. Yes, it is redemption through the blood of Christ. But salvation is being made alive together with Christ. And so what our point here is, this resurrection is an act of grace. That's what Paul is affirming. What resurrection? The spiritual resurrection from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Sometimes we don't think about salvation as a resurrection. It's not the resurrection that is to come at the second coming of Christ where all that are in the physical tomb shall be raised. But this is a resurrection of your spirit that is in a condition of death because it is separated from God. But when those sins are forgiven and the blood of Christ has cleansed your soul, then that is a renewal, a reconciliation. And Paul affirms in this passage, he makes you alive with Christ. And then he affirms, that is by grace. So when you think about all that grace does, much, if not the most important part for us, involves the word saves. And take grace out of that picture, there is no saving. Because there is no salvation apart from heaven's grace. Grace is in heaven, but that grace in heaven is what saves our soul. Well, we want to have time to talk about the second word. Think with me for just a moment. I said I would express to you in two words what heaven's grace does for you, how it impacts your life here upon this earth. We have suggested, as from these clear statements of Scripture, that it saves you. 
But what else does it do? Good question. We learn from our study of Scripture that what else heaven's grace does is simple, straightforward. It helps us. It gives us assistance. It does everything that is needed to help us. And we need help. I need help. You need help. Well, let me tell you. The kind of help that I need and you need to go to heaven is given by heaven's grace. Think about that. The Hebrew writer in chapter 4, verse 16 said, Let us therefore draw near with boldness to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. I've got some things in red letters there to, for emphasis. What we notice, first of all, and I have this statement on the left, that God's throne is interestingly characterized as a throne of grace. Heaven's grace is God's throne, characterized. That's its nature. But what we learn from this passage, as the Hebrew writer is encouraging us, let us therefore draw near to where? God's throne, to God, to the throne of grace. And so his throne is approachable. Can we, do we dare approach the throne of God? We're taught in this passage that we must do so with boldness, confidence, courage. Well, let me put that in context. In Hebrews chapter 4. It's because we have a high priest that is standing between us and God who qualifies to be our high priest because he experienced every infirmity that we experienced and yet without sin. And he has ascended back to heaven and stands before this throne of grace through whom <clears throat> we find grace to help in time of need. God has mercy on us to extend grace. And so, on this point from this passage, that we may receive mercy to find grace, what is the purpose of finding grace? To help in time of need. I think Rick is suggesting I have, <laughs> I pre appreciate brotherly love and brotherly help here. So. Well, this passage is, gives me the opportunity to express Sometimes people ask a question, what's the difference between mercy and love? Uh, grace. Well, they're very closely related, but they're not the same. And you experience it in your life. If you see someone that's hurt or someone that's suffering, you feel sorry for them. If your heart is sensitive to other people and their condition, you feel sympathy. And it could even be said you have pity on them. That's, that's a kind thing. Well, that's mercy. That's what mercy means. Well, then what does that allow you to do? If you have mercy upon them, you've shown your sympathy, and you have experienced that in its fullness in your heart then what does that allow you to do? Help. Do something. That's the grace. <laughs> See, mercy and grace go together. Now when you think about God and his relationship to you, his mercy looks upon you and feels sorry for you in this physical existence, in a sinful condition, needing help. So what does God do in his love for you? Send his only begotten son to this earth that he might help you. And so with grace, his mercy has acted. That's what we mean by that last statement. God has mercy on us to extend his grace. But I've noticed just a personal note on this. I read this passage quite often and I've noticed in some of our prayers here 
that some of the brethren who lead us in prayer, I'm hearing a more frequent reference to the throne of grace. Perhaps that's due to thinking more about it and realizing its true character. But without doubt and without question, we approach the throne of grace that we may receive that mercy and that we may find grace to help. Now, we're already saved. The Hebrews were already Christians. And so the reason that we approach heaven's grace is to get some help. And I'll tell you, you know and I know that we're living in a time when we need help more desperately, more often than ever because of the world in which we live, because of the challenges that come to us spiritually. And so heaven's grace helps us. This is a passage that was studied in the James class on Wednesday evening. But it deals with this correctly. In fact, this is probably the passage that suggested this whole study. James said in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace... Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, you see, grace is mentioned there a couple of times. But one of the first things that James says, do you think the scripture, in other words, he's pointing out to them, what I'm teaching you here is clearly taught in scripture, in other passages. And do you think the scripture doesn't mean what it says? Never. And so, God, he jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. He jealously desires our devotion and faithfulness. That's, that's a true statement. That's why the concept of spiritual marriage is involved in this passage. And James accuses them of being guilty of spiritual adultery because of their unfaithfulness to Christ. But our devotion and faithfulness makes us a person that God can regard as a friend. Now that's pretty significant. James has mentioned this with regard to Abraham in chapter 2. And he brings it into the picture of every Christian should be such a person that is so characterized that God can regard you as a friend. Well, what allows him to do that? When we give our spirit to him in devotion and faithfulness. But the point about grace, James affirmed he gives a greater grace. God gives heaven's grace. It's not just contained in heaven. It's not something we just long for God gives grace for the purpose of helping us become more like he wants us to be. But we can't ignore that last part. The reason that if one becomes a friend of the world, which James has already talked about, he becomes an enemy of God. The seriousness of that statement, the reason for that is God is opposed, sets himself in opposition to the proud, to those who function with pride and arrogance, self-assertiveness. To whom does God give greater grace? To whom is heaven's grace given? To those who are characterized by humility. So there's a lesson there to be learned in terms of heaven's grace. It's bestowed upon those to whom God gives, and that, of course, is to humility. The Apostle Paul mentions the grace of God as it occurs in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. 
He affirms in this passage, that's verse 11, that the grace of God has appeared. But it's done two things. Paul summarizes with Titus. One, it has brought salvation. We have already discussed that to all men, instructing us, reading the rest of the passage, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts or desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now here's a very important observation from this passage. What the grace of God has appeared to do, it has appeared, it, it's here. And what it has appeared to do, it does for everyone as far as this passage is concerned and what Paul is identifying. It does for all men. Now, that is getting to the point of the controversy. There are those in the religious world, and I will address more specifically in just a moment, who affirm that the grace of God appeared for just a selective few. That's not what the Bible teaches. You will hear that from time to time. If you listen to radio sermons, TV sermons, very often you will hear individuals proclaim that the grace of God is limited. It has appeared to just a few of the elect is a word that is often used. But our point here, how does it help us? It teaches us how to live. <laughs> It's, it's that straightforward and that simple. It teaches us how to live in this present world. How would you know by watching the world and being aware of everything that's happening in the world, as bad as it may get and may seem, we try to scratch our heads, what are we to do? How am I to live? Well, here's one way. Heaven's grace helps you. It tells you how to live. Because the grace of God has appeared instructing us how to live. And the Apostle Paul affirms the detail of that in this passage. As a result, we are prepared for heaven. We have lived our life in such a way as to be judged worthy of going to heaven and spending eternity with the Lord. I have a, a passage on here that just goes along with this. The Apostle Paul in Acts 20 and verse 32 has taken a pause in his return on this third missionary journey. He's come into Miletus and he has called the elders of the church at Ephesus to come down and meet him. And he gives them some encouragement and some exhortation. And this is one of the statements that Paul makes. It has to do with what we're talking about. We may have a question, how does heaven's grace teach me? Here the apostle Paul identifies that. He, to these men, to these Christians, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Think of our Bible. Think of the New Testament, the covenant of Christ as the word of God's grace. How often do we think of scripture as the word of God's grace? In other words, it's an expression of God's grace. And so what has come down to heaven to bring you heaven's grace? is the revealed scripture that you have in your hand that often we just lay aside and neglect, never read, never look at, never concerned with. And so if we look at the scripture, look at the Bible as the word of God, it is the word of grace that God has given uh, to us. I've had two words. Those words have to do with how the grace of God impacts your life. But I said I would discuss briefly, and that's what I intend to do, the controversial nature. Well, you're going to hear all sorts of things about heaven's grace out there in the religious world, in writings, 
in public orations, in programs, in literature, but I'm going to express this in one word. If you remember this one word, it is a word that conveys to your mind and your understanding of Scripture all you need to know to remember and understand the truth about heaven's grace as opposed to the false doctrine that is taught in the religious world, and that is the word conditional. It is conditional. Well, I knew that. Well, yeah, uh, uh, most Christians do. But what we also realize is that a large part of the religious world, if not most religious people today, believe it is unconditional. Just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. You know what that means? Most of the people in the religious world believe that God just bestows his grace upon people indiscriminately, unconditionally, for whatever, at his decision. That's not what the Bible teaches. And I can show you that in just a few minutes. There is, this connects to, and we've talked often about what is called Calvinism. Most are familiar with the system of religion that John Calvin started in the Protestant movement. John Calvin was born in 1509. He died in 1564. He was about 55 years of age. But in that short period of time, during that time of protesting Roman Catholicism, that Martin Luther, John Calvin, the Wesleys, and those, that group, John Calvin developed a system of doctrine that still permeates the religious world. And let me tell you what it is in brief. You spell the word tulip, T-U-L-I-P. I would write it on the board, but I'm not going to take that, that much time. Total hereditary depravity. That means even babies are born hereditarily depraved. Sinners. You, unconditional election. That God has said, okay, here's a group of people. Here's the population of the earth. I'm going to pick you, pick you, pick you, and the rest of you are lost. I'm going to choose you. So that's not fair. <laughs> I wouldn't, well, that's what this doctrine teaches. Unconditional, without condition, choosing. L, limited atonement. In other words, Christ died for a select few. He died for only for those who are unconditionally chosen. God chose this one, Christ died for that one. God chose this one, Christ died for that one. Didn't die for the rest of them. That's Calvinism. I, irresistible grace. The grace of God, heaven's grace, is involved in this false system of religion because it teaches that for those who are totally depraved, who are unconditionally chosen, for whom Christ has died with limitation for them, have a grace of God that will come upon them that will be irresistible. You can't resist it. It happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then P, the T-U-L-I-P, perseverance of the saints. You hear that, I hear that as once saved, always saved. Once all of that happens, there's nothing you can do to be lost. We've had debates on that. There have been preachers of the Calvinistic persuasion, not only of the Presbyterian whose religion is based upon this foundation, but it has permeated other denominations who get up and debate that there's nothing that a Christian can do. Even the worst sin that's imaginable according to the human standard of human conduct and be lost. They have argued and debated that from debate stands. But sadly, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that heaven's grace is conditional. Let me show you. 
That is Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we've had our access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. First of all, notice that being in the grace of God requires access. Isn't that what Paul says? He's talking about the key position of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through him, but through whom also, this is the part that's in red, that's what the Bible says now, we have had our access into this grace. Now that teaches that the grace of God requires access, just like your home requires access. You gotta have a key to unlock that door. Not just anybody, everybody can just walk in, hopefully. <laughs> the grace of God requires access. You have to access it. And what the Apostle Paul teaches in this passage is through faith or by faith. Now that's not faith alone, it's an obedient faith, a system of faith, in contrast to the system of works of the Mosaical law. Being in God's grace requires our fulfilling conditions. It's not unconditional. It is conditional. But let's look at uh, each one of these suggests some things that could be discussed further. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, the apostle simply affirmed, you are severed from Christ. Now that's a scary thought. You who have been justified by the law, you are fallen away from grace. That says what it says. I was reading recently a commentary. The individual came on this and he was actually saying, this really doesn't mean what it says. He's trying to tell me, now you read it and it says, but, but it doesn't really mean that. Well, honest Bible reading, honest Bible study can understand that passage. And it simply says the grace of God can be forfeited. You can lose it. One falls away from the grace when he is severed from Christ. Who would think that one could be cut off from Christ and still be in the grace of God? Paul is teaching that when you're cut off from Christ, you fall away from grace. That's simple Bible truth. Staying in God's grace is conditional for them they couldn't go back to the law of Moses. They couldn't go back as many of them were as we understand the controversy that was taking place in New Testament times and be circumcised and keep the law of Moses while they tried to keep the law of Christ and be Christian. No, 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 no. Paul simply said, if you would go back and try to be justified by the law, you're being, you're, you'll be cut off from Christ. And if that happens, you will be fallen away from grace. I believe this is the last point under the condition. This is Paul's first missionary journey. Get excited about Paul's missionary journeys. And he said in Acts 14, verse 43, he has preached what we call Paul's first recorded sermon. Paul has done a lot of preaching, but you want to read Paul's first sermon that's in Scripture that's written down. It's, it's this, but when the synagogue broke up, Many of the Jews and of the devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Some folks argue over whether these folks were Christians or not. I don't think that's an argument, <laughs> because I think this language implies they were in God's grace. 
if how is it possible for you to continue in something that you're not in to begin with? So we see that point. But Paul's point as he left them and left the synagogue as the assembly, people went their separate ways. There were certain of the Jews and of devout proselytes, some Gentiles who were converted to Judaism, followed them, and then Paul and Barnabas spoke to them and said, I urge you, I urge you to continue in the grace of God. Their continuing in the grace of God required urging, and they had to continue with it. It was dependent upon them. It was conditional. As you realize, and as I implied from the very beginning, a big subject. Back to where we started. And we'll say with the Apostle Paul to you, as he said to us as we read his letters in the New Testament, grace to you. Don't read that without meaning, without understanding of what that means. And so we exhort from this passage and from this multiple occurrences of this statement, say to us, may heaven's grace be in the life of each of us. Grace to you. We need to use it to do these two things, to save our soul and to help us get through life. There's probably not a day goes by to the diligent Christian, to the conscientious person who wants to go to heaven who does not accept the help of God's grace. And let us do our best to keep ourselves in the grace of God. There's a passage in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 13. This has always been striking to me. And what I believe the writer to be the Apostle Paul is saying to them. He's written concerning the superiority of Christ and what he says here. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. You know, when I read that, I believe that's what we've been trying to do all the time, but especially in the last two and a half years. All of us realize we've been involved in a special effort to get through the difficult time of the pandemic and the after pandemic consequences and the things that result trying to navigate this congregation to do what? To see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And so we try our best to do what is necessary to teaching and preaching and talking, discussing, to see that no one in this congregation falls short. And so I exhort you in closing, take upon yourself a personal accountability and responsibility to see to it that you don't fall short of God's grace. If you're here and not a Christian, so far, you're falling short of God's grace. If you're here and a child of God and been unfaithful and have not sought forgiveness for sin committed, then you're falling short of God's grace. We can be of help to you if you'll let us know while together we stand and sing this invitation song.